Last time we spoke about some inter introductory matters regarding the noble truths. This time we'll speak about the noble truths, the Ariya Satya, directly. Something of great importance that we must examine from the start are the words Ariya Satya themselves. Most of you have only heard the words noble truths and for us there's still quite a bit of, of doubt whether or not the words noble truth are a sufficient and proper translation of Ariya Satya. So we should look at these words as the first thing. The word noble generally can mean something like excellent, exalted, honorable, respectable. However, the word Ariya has the meaning to be without enemies. Ariya means without enemies. So are these, do these two words correspond sufficiently? And so when we speak of the Ariya Satcha, we should understand these in the sense of being without enemies. Here enemies is meant in the broadest sense, being, being free of things which aren't right for us, things which are undesirable. So we'll be looking at the Noble Truths in this way. The Ariya Satya includes within it, <coughs> or within them, Paticca Samupada. Both, both aspects of Paticca Samupada, both that the Paticca Samupada that de describes the arising of suffering, as well as the Paticca Sumupada or Paticca Nirota, which explains or which is the, the, the ceasing of that suffering. Both of these are included within the Ariya Satcha. The first two noble truths correspond to the, the dependent origination of suffering. And then the second two noble truths correspond to the, descent, the dependent cessation of suffering. The Ariya Satya include both kinds of dependent origination, the dependent origination of suffering and, or dukkha and the dependent cessation of of that dukkha. Both of these, of course, have to do with dukkha. It's purely a matter of dukkha and the ending of dukkha. And so, this is what ultimately the, or this is what the real meaning of enemies is. The real enemy is suffering, is dukkha. And so we should fully understand what is meant by dukkha as from the beginning. Now the Pali word dukkha may be quite unfamiliar for most of you or even those who have heard it before may not understand all of its connotations and meanings. In Pali this word dukkha means much more than suffering. One level of its meaning means simply pain, pain and suffering. But the second meaning is, is ugliness, to be completely ugly, thoroughly ugly. 
And then the third meaning is to be absolutely empty of any substance. So there are these three three meanings included within the word dukkha. Now all three of these meanings are correspond exactly with the word enemy. These are three aspects of being being our enemies. As for pain and suffering, that is quite apparent, quite obvious, how, how that is a kind of enemy. But ugliness, this may not be so apparent, how ugliness is our enemy. But we can say that in everything, every, at least every conditioned thing, every concocted thing, has a quality of ugliness to it. Without any exception, even the things we we want so badly, such as wealth, such as happiness, such as beauty, even these things have a quality of ugliness to them because there is so much trouble, so much difficulty and hassle involved in getting these things and maintaining these things, that within them there is an inherent ugliness. And so this is how the second meaning or aspect of dukkha is an enemy. It it brings us so much trouble. In all the things that, that we find lovely and attractive, These things have tremendous power over us and they have a tremendous pull. Things like wealth, power, fame, sex, beauty, they're all these things that we want so badly. And so we spend so much time and effort pursuing these things. There is this inherent ugliness in them that they bring us so much trouble, they make us so tired, they take up so much of our time. And in these things, there is, although they seem so desirable, so attractive, so wonderful, they're constantly changing, they're absolutely unstable. And so they deceive us, they trick us, They're never what they quite pretend to be. And so there is this this quality of ugliness. In all conditioned things, there is this impermanence. And in that impermanence is this, this ugliness, this inherent difficulty and hassle involved with them. And so they are... (coughs) They are inherently enemies, or this ugliness, not the thing themselves, this ugliness, is our enemy. If we look closely for ourselves, we can see that the, thing we lo- the things we love the most are the things that torment us the most. If we look like this, we can see quite clearly that these things are actually our enemies. As for the third meaning, it means being empty of any real substance. This word tukha, ka, can mean air or space, meaning, meaning in this case an emptiness, that there's, there's nothing in there that can be really, that can be, that we can hang on to, that we can cling to. This, this quality of being empty of any real substance that we can hang on to, hold on to, this is, this is an enemy as well. Take a look at this. When, when we fall in love, with something that is empty of 
of any real substance. How does that torment and torture the mind? What kind of pain and suffering does that bring us? So, this this aspect, this emptiness of any substance is dukkha, is an enemy. So the word dukkha encompasses all three of these meanings. The meaning that it, it tortures and torments us. Second, that hidden within it is this, this profound ugliness. And third, absolutely empty and void of any real s substance, any true essence. These three meanings together have mean much more than the word suffering. So we should be very careful to understand dukkha fully. Or if we want to use the word suffering, we should use it or understand suffering to, to mean all three, all three areas or aspects of dukkha. And so when dukkha has these three characteristics, three aspects, then we can't help but call it undesirable. This dukkha is the thing that is most undesirable of all. So that which is truly undesirable, or all these aspects of dukkha, are what are, is, are the things that are undesirable in every way. <coughs> Absolutely, thoroughly undesirable. The word ariya means to go away from enemies or to escape from enemies. And so ariya is that which is truly desirable in all respects. Dukkha is that which is undesirable. And the ariya sajja are those things which are truly desirable <coughs> because they take us away from all these enemies. We told you the other day that all of Buddhism is contained in the Ariya Satcha. These Satcha means truth or reality. And so Ariya Satcha is the truth that frees us from all enemies, the reality that allows us to escape from all enemies, that is, from, from all suffering. The Ariya Satcha are the, the, the new life, the life that is completely free of all, all dukkha. This is how we should understand the words, noble truths, the truths that free us from everything undesirable, everything dangerous. What we've said so far should make it obvious that there's nothing pessimistic in talking about dukkha as we have been doing. In fact, it's, it's, it's quite optimistic because the way we talk about dukkha is always with the sense of defeating it, escaping from it, being free of it, being victorious over it. There's, no, there's nothing frightening <coughs> or fearful or depressing about speaking about dukkha in this way because we we don't get lost in it or we don't give up to it we just learn about it in order to be free of it so there's there's nothing pessimistic about these ariya satcha 
In fact, they're rather optimistic because it, it shows us a way of living and it, it reveals to us the, the possibility, the potential, the duty to be free of suffering. And this gives us energy, courage, and confidence to, to practice in order to be free of all enemies. Next, we'll look at the characteristics or symptoms of this thing which is called dukkha. The first characteristic is a very natural one one that happens naturally for, for all living things. These are the, the characteristics of birth, birth, decay, disease, and death, or birth, illness, aging, and death. These are things that happen naturally for all of us. And there's really, in these things, there's no inherent problem. But there are many people who foolishly say that birth, aging, illness, and death are suffering, are dukkha. But this isn't really true. If we're trapped by our concepts of birth, aging, illness, and death, then this is great suffering. But it's, we can transcend birth, aging, illness, and death. We can beyond, be beyond these natural conditions and then they aren't any problem for us. We can turn them into problems if we're stupid, but it's, it's quite simple to not, not have them be any problems or any suffering for us. But these, these are the first characteristics of what for many people are, are dukkha, birth, aging, illness, and death. If you ever meet a Buddhist who tells, tells you that Buddhism teaches to not be born, not get old, not get sick, and not die, then that person really doesn't know what they're talking about. They're just repeating words that they've heard from someone else or read in a book. They've never, they haven't really experienced the Buddhist teachings themselves. Most correctly, we should say that Buddhism teaches that birth, aging, illness, and death are no problem. These things are no problem for those who, who understand correctly. We tell you this in advance just so that you won't be confused by certain things that you might hear from time to time. So we can summarize this, this, these aspects of dukkha by saying that to be free, or this, the point of these is to be free of the naturally occurring enemies that we call birth, aging, illness, and death. Now we'll mention some of the symptoms or conditions of dukkha. We'll mention them one by one. The first is soka or sorrow. The second is body dewa, means a kind of, it's often translated lamentation, which is like a spiritual crying. And then the word dukkha, dukkha, pain, physical pain, and then domanasa, which is mental pain or misery, and then upayasa, which is grief or despair. These are some of the forms which dukkha can take, and the Buddha has listed them as an example. It's not an all-inclusive list, and so there's sorrow, lamentation, physical pain, mental misery, and grief. These, these give us, help us to understand the, what it feels like, what dukkha feels like, the conditions 
of Dukkha. Next are the are aspects of Dukkha in terms as far as they ar- it arises from craving. We had the naturally occurring kinds of Dukkha. Now these are the Dukkha that arises specifically from craving from, from foolish desire. The first is being experiencing things we don't like. We have a craving for certain things and to experience things we don't like. This is one, one kind of suffering that comes from craving. And then there's being separated from the things we love and like. This is another kind of craving or pain and misery that comes from our craving. And then last is not getting the things we want. These three things, experiencing the unloved, being separated from the loved, and not getting the things we want, these are aspects of dukkha that arise from our our foolish desires, our blind craving. And so, you ought to work on this until you understand it for yourselves. Experience, feel it for yourselves within, within how experiencing things we don't like, being separated from the things we do like, and not getting what we want. How all three of these are dukkha. How all three of these are enemies to us. <clears throat> and then there's one last, <clears throat> there's one more, the most profound meaning of dukkha, which the Buddha said the, the, in the summary or the, the bottom line of all dukkha comes down to upadana. Upadana is foolish attachment, to grasp and cling to things foolishly, ignorantly. The Buddha said that, in short, all dukkha comes down to attachment in life, from attaching, grasping and clinging to life. Life here can be analyzed into five basic aspects or functions, body, feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness. These five aggregates of life or functions of life, when any of them individually or collectively are clung to, then there is dukkha. So the Buddha said, in short, all dukkha is attaching to the five aggregates of of life, the five functions of life. And so we must, we must beg all of you to do your best to understand these, these five things, which we call the khandas the khandas or the aggregates. These are the aggregates of life, the things that make up life. Body, feelings, perceptions, thought, and consciousness. These five together make up life. Please do your very best to understand these, to, to, exp- to see them clearly. The first aggregate is rupa, rupa, often translated form, or more simply just body. Rupa is all the physical, all the material parts of life. All the material components are rupa, sometimes we can say the corporeal, the bodily aspects. In the body there is a nervous system. There are the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, the body meaning the skin as a sense of touch, and the mind, the mind sense or the heart. 
This is the real meaning of rupa. These, this is the, and one in one sense, it's just the superficial aspect of life, the lowest part of life. But it still requires great attention. It's very important because the body, the the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, these. This is the foundation for all life, and so is the basis of all dukkha. The word rupa has a very interesting meaning for us. It means something which breaks easily, or something which is fragile, delicate. And also it, this implies that it, it breaks all the time. It, it falls apart ordinarily. So this rupa can mean fragile, easily broken. And if we go and take this rupa which breaks so easily, this very fragile body, as being I or mine, take a look and see how, how utterly <coughs> foolish that is, how, how crazy it is, how how insane to take something which is always falling apart to be the self, to be I, to be mine and then see what great suffering is involved whenever we take the body to be I, to be mine. Next we come to the mental aggregates. The first one is physical and the rest are mental. When there is, when we have this body or these bodies with nervous systems and the sense organs, then there will be, there will result certain mental functions or mental things, which are the, the, the mental aggregates. The first of these is Vetana. Vetana. It's translated feeling, but one must be very careful to understand the special meaning of Vetana, which is not what is much more subtle than what many people take to be feeling. Vetana is the, the very subtle, not subtle, the very simple, though sometimes very powerful, feeling of, of pleasure or happiness towards certain sense experiences or, or displeasure, even pain, dukkha, regarding other experiences. And then there's a third kind of Vedana, which is neither pleasant nor unpleasant. We can't really describe whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, but it's a definite kind of feeling. Now these three kinds of Vedana are not emotions. It's a very simple or even primitive kind of feeling. But they're very, very powerful. And they have tremendous influence on life. But no matter what, all of these vetana, whether pleasant, unpleasant, or undescribable, all of them are concocted. They're impermanent things that have been concocted out of our, our basic sensual experience. And so there's nothing in them that we can really depend on. So if we attach to these very fleeting feelings as I or mine, there will be dukkha. This is the, the second aggregate, vetana. We should, we ought to understand the vetana as things which deceive us most of all. There's nothing that tricks us like the vetana. Pleasant feelings dis, deceive us into falling in love. As soon as something is pleasant, we, we like it and we fall in love with it. Things that are unpleasant 
deceive us into into disliking, into anger, into into hatred. And then the undescribable kind of Vedana deceive us into worrying and doubting and wondering about that thing. So the Vedana are the things that are constantly deceiving us. This is how we we ought to understand them. Once we see how the Vedana deceive us and make fools of us, then we can see what enemies they are and how they are such suffering. These three kinds of feelings give rise, they stir up, or they they trick us into the three kinds of defilement. The first kind of of Vedana, this satisfying, pleasing, nice feeling. This, This stirs up the first kind of defilement, the defilement of rakha, lust, or we, it's all, some, we could say lopa, greed. Greed and lust are towards these satisfying, lovely kind of feelings. And so because of these pleasant feelings, we're, it makes us want to pull things in, to suck things in. The second kind of vetana, the, the unpleasant, the disagreeable, the not very nice kind of feeling. This, this leads to the defilements of dosa, hatred, or kota, koda, anger, which is this unpleasantness, this disagreeableness, makes us want to push things away, knock them away, or even destroy them, kill them. And then the third kind of vetana leads to to doubt, to to worry, to confusion, where the mind runs in circles around whatever it is. If something has this undescribable, we we really can't say whether it's pleasant or unpleasant kind of feeling. Then this really confuses the mind, and the mind spins round and round, whatever it is. The three kind of vetana lead to these three defiled reactions of trying to suck in, or trying to knock away to destroy, or then spinning around in very confused circles. How all of these, the inherent dukkha, of all this, the dukkha of sucking in, the dukkha of knocking away, the dukkha of running around in idiotic circles, the, the dukkha of this, what the, the quality of, and how these are, these three conditions are our enemies, is something that must become apparent to us. All the problems in the world can in fact be traced to the Vedana. The tremendous power of the Vedana to deceive us gives rise to all the problems that exist in this world. So we, these Vedana are are dukkha. There is tremendous ugliness in them. So we ought to observe them carefully in order to understand how the Vedana are, are our enemies. This is the second aggregate of life to, to which we so often cling, the second enemy. The next aspect of dukkha the next enemy is called sanya. This third aggregate can be translated perception. But don't just grab onto the English word. It's important to to understand how how this works. 
One's sanya is the result of vetana, or we could say vetana is the cause, the source of sanya. Whenever there is an experience, and then there is a, a feeling towards that experience, then there will naturally be sanya regarding that that experience. Sanya is to to regard the experience in one way or another, to regard it as something. This means such as to take it to be beautiful, take it to be ugly. It's a kind of discrimination which the mind will naturally do towards anything that is felt. This once this happens, once the mind discriminates or perceives it as beautiful or ugly, as tall or short or whatever, then also will come in, mem once this is done, if it is done firmly, this becomes memory. That thing is then, that, that label, that discrimination is stuck, aw stuck in a way in memory. And then every time we feel something, there is this regarding things in terms of, of often past experience. And so we take this to be man, this woman, this dog, this cat, and so on and so on. Regarding things as this or as that, this is what Sanya is about. Part of sanya is memory, but the important thing is re regarding things as, as something specific, particular. Because once we, we almost, and this is, is dukkha, this is an enemy for us because it's always done under the influence of ignorance. We're regarding things not as they really are, but as they aren't. For example, things that are, are dukkha are regarded as happiness. Things that are impermanent, constantly changing, are regarded as being permanent. <clears throat> and things which are selfless, which are not self, are taken to be self, are taken to be egos. And so because of perceiving things incorrectly, misperceiving them, this sanya is a lot of dukkha and is our enemy. We ought to understand sanya as attachment. Sanya is very similar to attachment because once we regard something as this or as that, then we, we're, we're generally attaching to it. It must be like this. It, it must be like that. So every time we go in and discriminate and regard something as, as beautiful, as ugly, as pleasant, as unpleasant, as happy, as sad, then we go and attach to that. So with Sanya there is, there is, there is almost always this attachment. And it's, this becomes even clearer when we, when we see how so often we perceive things as being my husband, my wife, my this, my that. So this perceiving things in this way is basically the same as attachment. And so we can see this, the dukkha of it, of always taking things to be this, taking them to be that, especially when it's taken to be mine or me. And then there's a, they become very heavy and they become enemies. When even even taking the 
even regarding the, the earth as earth and the sky as sky isn't quite, isn't quite correct. We, we perceive them, we regard them in one way, but then, but they don't really work exactly how they per we perceive them. They don't turn out as we perceive them. And so this is a lot of dukkha for us. We're always taking things to, to be a certain way, and they're never that way. And so this is a real problem for us. Sanya is very, is very broad. We're perceiving things constantly, but almost never as they really are. But no matter how much dukkha sanya is, it's something we just have to have. It's, sanya is something we can't do without. But just, just to, <clears throat> sanya is, is necessary for our, our lives. To, san, to perceive as Mr. A, Mrs. B, Mr. C, Mrs. D. Or to perceive this is Su and Mo. To, or perceive things as America, Australia, England, and so on. All these kind of perceiving things in these ways, all this sanya is necessary, but none of it is really true. None of it will, be, will happen the way we have perceived it. So we must understand them in this way. To see how these how the perceptions, how sanya can, can bite us, how it deceives us and tricks us, and how that can bite us in claws, and how that is an enemy, how frightening all these perceptions are. A very simple example of the problem of sanya, the difficulties with sanya, is that is, is with our memories. We try very hard to remember things. We try to store up and protect our memories. But then so often when we need to remember something, we can't. We try to remember and we just can't remember. This can, is how undependable sanya can be, what a hassle it can be. It's not the way we want it to be. We want to remember and we can't. This is a very simple example of the dukkha of sanya. But sanya is really much more than memory. In fact, the, the essence of sanya is, is not really memory. Memory is more of a result. We remember, remember things, we remember the things that we have regarded. First there must be this discrimination and regarding of something as this or as that, as man, woman, tall, short, good, bad, whatever. Once we've discriminated and regarded it in this certain way, then we store that as memory. But the, the real important thing to see is this discriminating regarding. It's a kind of labeling. That's the essence of, of sanya, and we, we can never really depend on it. Things are never the way we regard them. And so there is always a kind of frustrating, undependable dukkha to it all. The, the biggest, most enormous kind of sanya, as well as the lowest, most foul and despicable sanya is that of atta sanya, percep perception of self or regarding things as self. Atta means self. This is the, the biggest problem or the, this is the whole problem of, of sanya that we are always taking things to be self. We're perceiving things as selves, as separate in entities, and then regarding them 
accordingly. We actually believe that I'm a self, this is a self, that's a self, all these selves all over the place. And then this becomes the foundation for all the rest of, of Sanya. Descartes came up with the line cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. But there was nothing really re original about this. Much earlier, when mankind began to perceive things as self, <clears throat> then just to take, to think that I exist, just because I think is to regard the thinking as, as self. And so Descartes was just, was just putting into words something that had been going on for thousands of years, this regarding things as self. This is the whole problem of Sanya. This is what makes it so heavy. And this is how Sanya can bite us and claw us and torment us because we're always regarding things as self. Mind and body, this, this mental and material combination that makes up life, it can experience, it feels, it can think without there being any need for, for any self. There's, please don't believe Descartes that says because we think there must be an ego or a self, that I must exist. It's a very natural process that the body and mind experiences, feels, and thinks. It doesn't depend at all on any kind of ego or self. But because the way we do experience and think, because of ignorance, we go and assume that, that there must be a self in there. And so we perceive things as, as selves. And then this bites us, this, this causes all kinds of troubles and hassles in life. But in fact, there's no real self or ego there, so there's no need to believe what Descartes says. We shouldn't assume that just because we think there must be a self. We should look at thought and see how it really works before making assumptions. And so this is the third of the aggregates that we cling to, the third kind of natural function that we turn into an enemy because of our own misunderstanding, especially this, this misunderstanding of, of self, that things are ourselves. The fourth aggregate of life is called Sankara in Thai Sankhan, <coughs> in Pali Sankara. Sankara, as the fourth aggregate, specifically emphasizes thinking or thought. And then we, we call it Sankara Khanda. But the word Sankara has a very broad meaning. Sankara means conditioning. But there are these three aspects to it. There's the, the one who conditions, the conditioner, the causal aspect of conditioning. Then there's the the, the thing that is conditioned, the condition, the, the effect aspect of conditioning. And then there's the process of conditioning, the, the conditioning itself. So there are these three aspects, interrelated, interconnected aspects of Sankara. The conditioner, the condition, or the conditioned thing, and then the, the conditioning, the process. Now all three of these, whenever there is a living body, and there is feeling, and there is perception, 
this conditioning will be going on all the time. But what is the real, the most important aspect of this for us is that when this conditioning is happening, it's constantly conditioning thought, all kinds of thoughts and ideas. So, Sankara has a very broad meaning. It, can, it applies everywhere. But here we're using it in a more limited sense, Sankara Kanda, that whenever there's life and feeling and perception, then there will be this conditioning of the mind, this stirring up this concocting of the mind, which is essentially the conditioning of thought, of thinking. This is the... And then once this thinking takes place, we go and regard it as being self, as being I. We think about things in terms of I. We think, and so we think that we, that I, am, I exist. And so this is the, the fourth enemy, the fourth thing that bites us. It's, it's quite pathetic in a way that in Thailand and maybe other countries as well, the word Sankara is only understood as meaning the body. For many Thais, if they say the word sankhan, they just mean the body. This isn't completely wrong, but it's, it's not very correct either. It's just a little bit correct. Sankara, in the broadest sense, includes the body, but there's much more to it than that. And to think that sankhara is just the body is to, to miss the most important aspect of it. Sankara can, we can understand it in terms of the things being stirred up or the creation and then the, the dissolution of things. This is Sankara, things being created and then they dissolve. This arising and passing away of things is the essential process of Sankara. A word that can help us to understand this is the word conceive. Conceive we use both to conceive thoughts, but we also use it when, when the sperm fertilizes the egg, and then a new physical life is conceived. This sankara can be understood as this, the, the starting of new things, the giving birth to to new things. And so because of all this sankhara, thoughts are constantly born in the mind. And then this constant activity of sankhara is, keeps the mind spinning around, keeps it very busy. And that can be a lot of dukkha. Now for the, the ordinary tie in the street, in the, in the colloquial usage of the word sankhara, if we say to put out the sankhara, it means to die. This is what many people, like in English, we would say to pass away. They would say to dap sankhan, to put out the sankhara, meaning death. But this isn't what it really means, to, to put out or to quench, to extinguish the sankharas, means to just stop all that conditioning and concocting of the mind. All that concocting is very tiresome, very troublesome. It doesn't allow the mind to have any peace. To extinguish this concocting of the mind is, has nothing to do with with dying. And so we should understand it correctly. When all that sankhara, the conditioning, concocting is going on, the mind can never be at peace. But to extinguish that is very cool, very peaceful, very open and free. 
So the sankara, this concocting of the mind, this is the fourth aggregate of life, which can cause us so many problems. This, when this concocting, all this sankara is going on, then it is never peaceful. But we should understand here that when we talk about sankara like this, we mean the sankara that is a result of ignorance. When things are misunderstood, then there is a concocting of the mind which inevitably leads to dukkha. But when this, this ignorant concocting of the mind, when this sankara ceases, then there is great, great peace. There is a very, a very calm and spacious joyfulness. And so, a very common saying in Thailand is, De sang wu basamo su ko, which means the, the calming of the sankharas is bliss. The, sank, the calming of the concocting is happiness. Whenever this concocting of the mind, that ha this concocting through the power of ignorance, whenever this calms down, quiets down, then there is, there is joy. If that gets stirred up again through the power of ignorance, then the joy disappears and there is dukkha. And so it is also, another phrase is sankara parama dukkha. Parama means supreme. Concocting is the supreme torment. This constant stirring up and concocting and, and grinding and spinning around of the mind is, is the ultimate dukkha. But always understand that this concocting we're talking about comes from ignorance, from misunderstanding. If there is correct understanding, there is no sankara. The mind is not concocted. There are just the natural processes of life taking place. And that's not what we mean by sankara. But when, in addition to the natural life processes, which can include thought, there is, there is no... When in addition to that, there is this, this stirring up, this busying, this concocting of the mind, then there is dukkha. This is the, the fourth aggregate. At every funeral ceremony in Thailand, at every kind of ceremony involved, involved with funerals or, or memorials to people who have died, the monks always chant the line, De Sang Wu Basamo Su Ko. Stop the concocting and that is happiness. Stopping the concocting is the supreme happiness. And this is repeated over and over again. The average Thai hears this hundreds of times in their life. It's being repeated all over the place, but unfortunately it, it's had almost no result. People are hearing all the time Stopping the concocting is supreme happiness, but it's quite pitiful that nobody seems to hear or to listen. It's like playing a flute for rhinoceroses or playing a flute for, for, for turtles. It, it just never gets through. So please <clears throat> give adequate attention to this sankara, this concocting of the mind. Whenever this happens, there will be dukkha. <clears throat> Life will not be at peace. This sankara here is inevitably the result of ignorance. <clears throat> if there is correct knowledge and understanding, this sankara, as we're using it here, 
will, will not happen. It's only the result of ignorance, of looking at life stupidly. And then this, this concocting of the mind takes place. Whenever the mind is concocted by ignorance, then there, there occur all kinds of foolish thoughts. And so all of this becomes an enemy for me. When the mind has been concocted, then there is me exists, I exist. And then all this concocting is a problem for me. It's my enemy. So we ought to be very careful about it all. The next and final aggregate is called vijnana. In Pali, in Thai they call it vijnan, vijnan. Pali, vijnana. This can be a tricky word because it's been given many different meanings. In Thai, the many Thais think vijnan means spirit. And this is related to the, the Hindu definition of vijnana, which existed before Buddhism which meant a soul or spirit that, that spun around within many births, within many reincarnations. It was, in pre-Buddhist thought, it was the, they thought, the thing that they thought would be, would leave this body when it died and go and be born in another body, be reincarnated. That was called the vijnana. But that's not the understanding of Buddhism. That's not what vijnana means in the Buddha's teaching. In Buddhism, vijnana is the thing or the function that, that causes consciousness of various things. Whenever there is consciousness of something, it happens through vijnana. There are six kinds of vijnana. There's eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, vijnana. Whenever we're conscious of anything through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind, that is the, through the functioning of vijnana. It's the very basic knowing or, or consciousness or awareness of something, of anything. Now there are, in a way, two levels to this. The first is when the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, or body receive some stimulus, and then there is consciousness of that stimulus. This is the first level of vijnana. Then mind consciousness knows the meaning of that thing. Then it's known to the, directly in the mind. First there's the, the outer senses kind of consciousness. Consciousness of the senses being stimulated by this thing. And then the mind, then there's mind consciousness knows the meaning of it. And this leads to the feelings towards things, the Vedana and then the perception and all the sankhara that we've talked about. This is the, the, the fifth aggregate, and it's happening everywhere. Wherever there is consciousness of anything, there is this vijnana. <clears throat> In Thailand, the Hindu teachings came here first, way before Buddhism came. So when the Hindu or Brahmanistic teachings came to Thailand, they brought this idea, this teaching of a, a vijnana in the sense of a soul or spirit that inhabited all kinds of things, not just people, but trees and, and rocks and all over the place. All things had this spirit. And then when that thing died, the body died, that vijnana would go and get reincarnated. This is a Hindu teaching which existed in Thailand long before Buddhism came. 
and it was very firmly, deeply implanted in, in the Thai religious culture. And so later, when Buddhism came, everybody already had this Hindu understanding of Vijnana. And so many people have been in, unable over the centuries to understand the Buddhist teaching of Vijnana, which is, must be understood in light of the, the central teaching of Buddhism, that of anatta, that in life there is no self, no soul, no spirit in the Hindu sense. In Buddhism, Buddhism denies that there is any such thing. So the meaning of vijnana in Buddhism is the reaction that arises when a sound, <coughs> when a sight, a sound, a taste, or whatever stimulates the respective sense organ. And then there arises this consciousness. So we must discriminate between the two kinds of vijnana, the kind that was the Hindu teaching which came to Thailand first and then the Buddhist teaching which came later. If we don't discriminate between the two, we'll be very confused. In the, the Buddhist scriptures, the, in one of the discourses of the Buddha, it's recorded how a, one of the monks who had been staying with the Buddha had, had confused this issue of vijnana. This one monk was named Kewata Putta. Kewata, which means fisherman. Mm -hmm. Sa his name was Sati, the fisherman's son. This monk had the opinion or the understanding that just this vijnana speaks, or just this vijnana thinks, speaks, and dies and then goes to be reborn somewhere else. He was going around saying this, that it's the vijnana that, that thinks, that speaks, and that goes and gets reincar reborn somewhere. The monks heard him saying this and they went to talk to the Buddha. They reported this to the Buddha and the Buddha called him, called him in for a, a little talk and asked him, what, what is your understanding of vijnana? And the monk told him. And the Buddha basically said, you've, you've got it all wrong. In this teaching, in this teaching here, vijnana is something that arises right here as a reaction to stimulus of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Whenever there is a sense stimulus, there arises vijnana. According to this monk, vijnana was some, some everlasting thing that was always there. And this is directly, um, in, this, is, this is directly against what the Buddha was teaching. So this was, these were quite strong words of the Buddha to, to show that this monk was complete, had been living with the Buddha and had gotten some, such an important point completely wrong. And so it was a bit embarrassing for that monk and he became very depressed. And this shows that even people living with the Buddha himself had trouble and could confuse this, this point of vijnana. But what's very important is to see that vijnana isn't some lasting substance as it's understood in just, just about everywhere. This is the common human understanding. But that vijnana just arises. It's just this awareness that arises with the stimulation of the senses. This, <clears throat> this, in many religions, just about all religions, such as the Hebrew religion that existed before Christianity, 
or you can find it in Greek philosophy, and all over the place you find talk or teaching about the spirit, the soul. And in fact, for most of you sitting here, there is probably this kind of a, an understanding of some belief in a self or in a spirit or soul of some court kind. Everyone is free to think as they wish, but please don't bring that idea into Buddhism. The vin don't, don't apply the word spirit or soul to the word vijnana in Buddhism. Vijnana is merely the, the basic consciousness or awareness of sense objects that stimuli the sen stimulate the sense organs. Now, if, because if we confuse this issue, it will be very, very difficult for us to ever understand religion. This whole, um, this whole question of vijnana and all the very many interpretations given to it make it very difficult for us to really understand spirituality. And if we don't understand vijnana correctly, then it is impossible to ever quench dukkha. We'll always be tormented by dukkha as long as we misunderstand vijnana. If we take this vijnana to be some kind of spirit, then it will be like a ghost which will keep haunting us, keep, keep tormenting us. It's necessary, if we would like to free ourselves of dukkha, to, to understand, to find out what vijnana really is, how it really works. But for most of the time, it's deceiving us, it's tricking us. And we're, we're constantly taking vijnana to be I, this, this quality of, of awareness that is with us right now. We're, we're, we're identifying with it for the most part as, as I see, I hear, I smell, I touch, I taste, I know. All this, all this attaching to vijnana is a very deep-rooted habit and which turns vijnana into an enemy. It makes vijnana bite us, makes us suffer. So this is why I requested earlier that you try your best to, to know, to understand these five khandhas. If we don't understand the five khandhas, then there's no way that we can understand Buddhism. If we haven't gotten to know the five khandhas, Buddhism will always remain a mystery to us. So it's it's absolutely essential that we start to understand them. Otherwise, we'll keep taking them to be self, keep taking them to be I. Sometimes we cling to these five aggregates as, as I, and sometimes as mine. We cling to these, them as self or as belonging to self. So sometimes I am the body, or sometimes it's my body or I am these feelings, sometimes it's my feelings, or I am the perceptions, sometimes it's my perceptions, like this. But whenever we regard any of these khandhas, any of these aggregates of life as I or mine, when we take them to be selves or belonging to selves, self, like this, then, then it bites, it bites the mind it inflicts dukkha on the mind. So it's crucial to understand these five khandhas. If we really understand them, if we really see them as they are, we'll see that they are not self, that none of these khandhas or any combination of them or anything outside of them can be taken as I or mine. Only by knowing the khandhas thoroughly can
can we understand Buddhism. Until this happens, this will create endless problems for us. We'll keep grabbing onto these to various aspects of life as I or mine, and that will bite, and that turns life into our enemy. And so this is why the Buddha, the Buddha said, Sankitena Bachupana Dhanakanta Dukkha. This was, the Buddha said, if we speak concisely, the five aggregates that are attached to are the essence of dukkha. In short, all dukkha comes down to these five aggregates when we cling to them. So this means that the, the essence of dukkha is attachment, or the Pali word is upadana. Whenever there is upadana in any of these five functions of life, then there will be dukkha. He used the word the pancha, which means five, upadana kanda, the aggregates of clinging, or the, these aggregates that are, are clung to, attached to. This is the essence of all dukkha. Sankitena bachupada nakanda dukkha. All dukkha comes down to these five khandas that are clung to. So the key word here is the word upadana. It's not so much the aggregates themselves, but this, this upadana. And in Buddhism, this can be a tricky word to understand. So we'll give of the best definition we can of it. Upadana is to regard something according to the power or of ignorance or whenever we guard re, regarding something under the influence of ignorance that will be attachment that regarding things through ignorance this is attachment and as soon as there is this regarding things ignorantly foolishly, stupidly, then there must be dukkha. The matter of the dukkha ariya satcha, the noble truth of dukkha, isn't finished yet, but the time is up, so we'll continue tomorrow.